Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the, uh, I would say, the seventh uh, lecture in GI system. So let me, guys, start with uh, uh, the topographical divisions pattern of the abdomen that we use. Guys, the abdomen, you have to know how to divide the abdomen uh, for phys physical examination to locate the different structures and organs in the abdomen, especially during physical examination or injury and so forth. So because you have to know, you have to, to know how to describe what's going on in that region. You cannot say right, left, up and down, no. So we have, guys, two uh, topographical division. We can divide the abdomen into four parts, as you see in the figure, or to nine parts. So we have four quadrant pattern and nine region pattern. Well, first of all, I will start with the four quadrant pattern. It's pretty easy. Just the patient lying down, just divide the abdomen like by imaginary lines into four regions by two trans umbilical plane. So it's pretty easy and direct. That means we need two planes, both of them pass through the umbilicus simply. This one and this one. Because they pass through the umbilicus, we call them trans umbilical plane. One is horizontal and one is vertical. That's it. So by this way, through these two lines that they pass through the umbilicus, you divide the abdomen into four quadrants. Two up or uh, superiorly and two inferiorly. So guys, let us see this one. It's on the right side, right? So it's the upper one. So this is the right upper quadrant. But this is also on the right, but inferiorly. So we call this quadrant is the right lower quadrant. On the other hand, this is the left side of your body. So these two quadrants, one is the left upper and this is the left lower. That's it. So for example, you can describe that the liver, mainly the liver located in the right upper quadrant. This here is the liver, right? Or you can say um, that part of the stomach is located mainly in the left upper quadrant. So guys, uh, this is the uh, four quadrant pattern, which is pretty easy. But as a physician, I think uh, you have to be more specific. What does it mean? It means that you have to divide the abdomen into more divisions. Like you have to uh, find like subdivisions more than the four. So for that, there is another pattern, which is the nine region patterns. Also, it's a pretty easy. But just give me your attention. You know, guys, this is the clavicle. You know the clavicle. You can locate it in your body. You can palpate it, of course, easily. And this is the uh, left clavicle as well. So this is the midpoint, right? This is the midpoint of a clavicle. And this is the midpoint of a clavicle. From there, just send two vertical planes or lines all the way until you reach this midpoint. This ligament this is a very important ligament. We'll talk about it like I will repeat a thousand times. This is inguinal um, ligament. We'll talk about it. And there's another here until you reach there, right? So these are two vertical lines passes from the midclavical or midclavicular points. So these are planes known as midclavicular planes. Also, we need another two planes, but not vertical, horizontal. You know the uh, this is the costal cartilage and this is the costal margin. Let me use another one. This is the costal margin. You can palpate it also, guys, for yourself and for patients as well. Just 
put a horizontal plane just below it. This is number one. And another horizontal plane. Do you know the iliac crest? This is the iliac crest. Iliac crest, the highest part of hip bone. This one. Wait. This is the iliac crest. Right? And um, here is the iliac crest. And guys, you have a tubercle here. And on the other side, guys. So we need to draw a line here. Sorry. Across these two tubercles. So, guys, this line is inter. This is a tubercle. And this is a tubercle of iliac crest. This is the intertubricular plane. Somebody can say, how can I locate the iliac crest? It's pretty easy. Put your hand just uh, uh, on your flank and just make a little bit of uh, pressure. You will feel that you can follow the bone uh, on your flank. So the highest point is the iliac crest. يعني حطي دقاء خاصرتك وشديت بتلاقي في عظمة بارزة أعلى نقطة هناك هي الإيليك كريست Lateral to it there is a tubercle So this is the as I said this is the another the second horizontal plane which is known as intertubricular plane Excellent So just to know remember these numbers when you subdivide the abdomen into nine region l135 i will tell you why forget now one so this plane the what's known as subcostal plane because under the costal cartilage the subcostal plane at the level of um, uh, l3 intertubricular plane at the level of l5 but you know, some people don't like that. They don't like, uh, or they prefer to use another two horizontal planes. They don't like subcostal plane and um, uh, intertubricular plane. So, okay, there is an, uh, there is an alternative, uh, 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 I would say, nine region pattern. Still, we have two midclavicular planes. But the only change is the uh, is the transverse or the horizontal planes. So we will use a very useful plane, which is called transpyloric plane. You know, this is the stomach, and this is the pylorus of the stomach. So there is a plane across the pylorus of the stomach, known as transpyloric plane, and there is a plane between the these two anterior processes anterior superior iliac spine it's called interspinous plane this anterior superior iliac spines guys you can feel it very easy just feel the uh, put your hand here on the iliac crest and continue with your fingers anteriorly feel it feel it feel it until you reach the bridge after that you will fall down this protruded bone that you can all of guys feel it anteriorly is the uh, anterior superior iliac spine this is very very important landmark very important landmark anterior superior uh, uh, iliac spine now which is personally i prefer this because it's pretty easy. Just two midclavicular uh, plane, then transpyloric plane, then interspinous plane. I know midclavicular planes are very easy to locate, and interspinous plane very easy to locate. But somebody can say, yes, how can I locate the transpyloric plane? Excellent. Guys, you know the jugular notch? You can feel it also. You can palpate it. Jugular notch up. The, sub the upper part of the sternum. And... The symphysis pubis, also you can palpate it. This is the symphysis pubis. Just midpoint between jugular notch and symphysis pubis, 
So this midpoint is the transpyloric plane. Somebody can say, okay, I can't expose the patient. I can't, it's, it's too long. Okay, there's another way to locate the transpyloric plane. You know the to process? You can palpate it. You know the umbilicus? This is the umbilicus. Also, the midway between the zygote process and umbilicus is the transpyloric plane, which is I prefer. Very simple. So now this is how to uh, to uh, draw the lines and divide the abdomen into nine regions. But what these regions are? Okay, we have nine regions. This is the umbilicus, right? We have mid guys. We have three in the middle, three laterally right, three laterally left. So nine, right? Nine regions. This is the umbilicus. So this region is the umbilical region. Okay, above it, which is close to the uh, that contains the stomach, this is epigastric region. But the area above the pubic bone here is the pubic region. Excellent, guys. To the uh, both sides, the same. We'll talk about one side just because it's the same on the left. This is the uh, costal margin, so the area. Under the costal margin mainly is the hypochondrium, hypo under the costal cartridge or uh, rib, uh, ribs and costal cartridge. Right hypochondrium and we have left hypochondrium. Now this is your flank, Khasr Takiani. So this is right flank and left flank or lateral region sometimes they call it. Flank or lateral region. Now, and this region, guys, is the right groin and left groin, or they call it, clinically they do use groin. They call it inguinal region. Inguinal regions, which is I prefer to use, guys. Okay, this is how we divide the abdomen to describe different structures here and there. And uh, we have four and nine regions. Now, let us, guys, um, take, um, I would say, a cross-section through the... That's crazy right now. Let us take a cross-section uh, uh, through the anterior abdominal wall. So, your abdominal wall, Jidar Batnak al-Amami, is formed of seven layers. Let us start from superficial, guys, and move to the deep. Superficially, guys, you have the skin, right? This is the skin. Under the skin, so this is the story. Some of you guys have a lot of this fat under the skin, right? But anyway, always, most of the time in your body, below the skin, there is a superficial fascia, something called superficial fascia and superficial fascia guys composed from two layers so we have a skin under the skin obviously you have fat or fatty layer which is the superficial fascia superficial fascia two layers look at it here this is the superficial fatty layer and there is another deep membranous layer so we have Fatty layer and membranous layer. Guys, the um, fatty layer is known as camporous fascia. In, you know, clinicians do use superficial fatty layer. They use camporous fascia. So this is camporous fascia, right? Now, the membranous layer, guys, known, okay, it's the membranous, deep membranous layer which is important, I will talk more about it. It's scarps fascia. It's called scarps fascia. Okay, now we have skin, superficial fascia. Superficial fascia, two layers. Yes, fatty layer and membranous layer. Okay, now deep to superficial fascia. Usually, deep to superficial fascia, we have deep fascia. And I would like you guys to know that the uh, 
indeed the uh, deep fascia I'll use this pen I think black one the deep fascia guys is merely very thin layer in the abdomen يعني مش سميكة very very thin so it just covers the simply the um, uh, muscular layer as you uh, see guys but it's merely like the investing or uh, the deep fascia you know you have three superficial intermediate and deep but they are very uh, thin so as we mentioned they cover the uh, muscle that means we reach the muscular layer I will use the right pen now so you have three layers of muscles we have external oblique we have internal oblique and we have transversus abdominis muscle so skin superficial fascia with two layers deep fascia muscular layer excellent now deep to the uh, muscular layer guys what, what we call this muscle this muscle is the uh, the last one transversus abdominis right this one is the transversus abdominis muscle excellent so it's lined by a fascia guys right it lines by a fascia which is the the same name it's the uh, uh, transversus abdominis it's the fascia layer that lines uh, the, uh, that uh, uh, lines it is the transversalis fascia it's important transversalis fascia so we have muscles external internal oblique and transverse abdominis lined by transversalis fascia now deep to the uh, uh, transversalis fascia we have another fatty layer which is the known as extra peritoneal fat extra peritoneal fatty uh, layer this one extra peritoneal fat other than the camper's fascia yes we have extra peritoneal fatty layer deep to it now the last uh, layer which is the parietal peritoneum parietal peritoneum is the uh, last internal layer that lines your abdomen that means if you are inside the abdomen the first layer you will see in your face is the parietal peritoneum that means during surgery or laparoscopy the last layer that you will penetrate is the parietal peritoneum excellent these are seven layers now guys let me give you just a, a brief uh, clinical points about this layer I have to go a little bit fast so about the superficial fascia we said that superficial fascia composed from fatty layer and membranous layer let us talk more about this layer so guys in the abdomen because talk about the abdomen the fatty layer here this is the fatty layer or nas compass fascia it's you know distributed over the rest of your body right up and below everywhere this is the fatty layer right you see it here right everywhere around your body but now what about the membranous layer this is the membranous layer in a blue color guys there is a couple of things here first of all it's thin and of course you know when it goes up it faded up and laterally so it will end I mean up and laterally this is the first thing the second thing now this is up and laterally yes will fade it out but what about inferiorly guys the deep fascia of the thigh this is the deep fascia I will use this pen. this is the deep fascia of the thigh deep fascia is a tough fibrous 
um, uh, layer that covers the muscles and other structures in the leg. So this is the fascia. Now the you have to know that the membranous layer of superficial fascia binds or united with here it's fused with the deep fascia of the thigh at this point that means the membranous layer fused at this point this is the fusion or line of fusion here where is that exactly you know the inguinal uh, ligament this is the inguinal ligament this is a shadow of inguinal ligament from anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle here so one finger breadth اصبع واحد تحت ال inguinal ligament is the infusion the line of inf uh, the line of fusion that means the line of fusion of membranous layer with the deep fascia here what's the significance of that okay before talk about the significance of that let me show you here that the membranous the membranous layer of um, superficial fascia or scarps fascia this is scarps fascia right so it's it doesn't fuse with the pubic bone that means there is a, a tunnel here anteriorly okay also the um, membranous layer and the scrotum uh, it continues sorry around the uh, uh, scrotum all the way until it reaches the perineal area so it's open it attached to both sides of pubic bone but it continues around the scrotum now one thing we forgot to say about the fatty layer we said that it's distributed along of all of your body right but when it's reached look at it once it reached the scrotum the fatty layer replaced by a dartos muscle right it becomes like a muscle dartos muscle which helps to uh, in contraction of scrotum up so the fatty layer a scrotum replaced by uh, uh, a muscle here known as dartos uh, muscle and guys again as you see here the membranous layer continues um, uh, around the penis and around the scrotum and until it reaches the perineal area you know the membranous layer here around scrotum they call it colis fascia it's the same it's a scarps fascia but around the scrotum they give it another name colis fascia okay let us talk about the significance of that guys if there is a rupture in the penile urethra here so the urine will uh, extravasate up deep to the membranous layer deep to scarps fascia up into the anterior lower part of anterior abdominal wall and it will extravasate around the penis as you see here and also the urine will extravasate to the scrotum and also to the perineal area but somebody can say the urine can distribute down to the thigh no because as i said the scarves fascia united with the deep fascia at this line just one finger breadth below the uh, uh, inguinal ligament that's it so this is the uh, important part of our body so look at guys let us now move deep we mentioned guys we have skin superficial fascia but we have also muscular layer three layers the first most external one is the external oblique muscle look at the direction of the fiber downward forward and medially cut this muscle as you see here let us cut it so you will find another one deep to it which is not the external oblique it's internal oblique so it moves also obliquely but it's forward medially and not downward it's upward 
So it's opposite to the external oblique. It's perpendicular to its fiber, right? This is external oblique and this is internal oblique. So it's perpendicular to it. Now let us cut also the internal oblique. You will find another muscle deep to it. Simply, it's known as transversus abdominis because related to the abdomen and because of its direction of its fiber. Look at the direction of the fibers. Transversity, right? Okay. I would like guys to focus me to know what I want from these muscles. First of all, this is the external oblique muscle. From this point, you have to... I don't like muscles, but we need to study these three muscles to understand what's going on here clinically. Okay. So, this is the external uh, oblique muscle. And there is a muscular part. And anteriorly, this is the uh, mid, uh, median line, right? It's the umbilicus. Anyway, so there is a muscular part, and it's not completed anteriorly. It's completed by aponeurosis. This sheet is the aponeurosis. Look at it here. So, Shumano. So guys, uh, this muscle originates from the uh, uh, rib number uh, 5 until like 12, from 5th to the 12th rib. And that, you know, aware with the direction in this direction, downward, forward, and medially, and inserted into, look at the insertion, into the anterior half of outer lobe of iliac crest. Let me show you. I don't like to explain just without. This is the iliac crest. The iliac crest has lips. يعني إلو two lips هو حقيقة two lips وبالنصف في region. So the outer region هاي سمي ال outer lip. Internally there is internal lip. In between there is intermediate zone. Right? Simply. So the external um, uh, oblique muscle uh, 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 inserted in the anterior half of outer lip inserted here in the anterior half of the outer lip and of course in the pubic uh, let me show you here uh, look at the pawn here let me show you a couple of uh, landmarks this is the symphysis pubis here is the symphysis pubis just lateral to the symphysis pubis, the highest point here is the pubic uh, crest. This is pubic crest. Lateral to it, here we have pubic tubercle. Hydolal bruzian, very important. So, pubic, uh, we have symphysis pubis, we have pubic crest, and we have pubic tubercle. Okay, so again, do you know? I don't know if you have an idea about it, but this is the uh, iliac crest, ala mantiqa fil ilium. Anteriorly, it ends by this bone. This is the anterior, superior iliac spine because you have anterior inferior here. I don't, I, I have nothing to do with it. So we have anterior superior iliac spine. The bruise has the amami alulwi. This is very important with the pubic tubercle. Keep it those in your mind also. Okay, guys. So look at the abneurosis. Look at the abneurosis of the muscle. It's inserted here in the pubic tubercle, and in the linea alba. You see this midline fibrous sheath, the white one. This is linear because it's like line, fibrous line. Linear alba, alba white. So, so this is a fibrous, mid, fibrous uh, uh, line in the midline, linear alba. So this is the insertion. Of course, the innervation from T7 to T12 because they originate from 5th to 12th. Reps. Anyway, 
this is not important here is the important point guys look at the again focus at this look at the aponeurosis here what's going on of the external oblique muscle yes this is external oblique muscle and this is its aponeurosis look what's happening here to the aponeurosis guys look at it here look at it here so this is the external oblique muscle and it's aponeurosis or called aponeurosis of external oblique it's it reflected on itself like this make like a cuff and it creates a kind so look at here at the lower border of the aponeurosis this is the lower border of aponeurosis of external uh, oblique that forms the inguinal ligament this is the inguinal ligament attached to the anterior superior edex spine and the pubic tubercle and also it's reflected as you see here so this reflection this is anterior superior this is the inguinal ligament that's reflected here to create a kind of uh, uh, lacunar ligament this is the lacunar ligament like u shape and the lacunar ligament continues up on the bictinal line to form bictinal ligament most importantly guys this ligament is the inguinal ligament okay what you can see in the uh, 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 in the aponeurosis of external oblique what you can see here guys look at it here at the end of it there is a kind of a defect there's an opening here in the aponeurosis of external oblique so this is this opening uh, guys is the known as superficial inguinal ring this is inguinal region and this ring is the superficial one because we have deep one i will show you later so this is the external the aponeurosis of external uh, oblique that's you know inferiorly reflected on itself to form inguinal ligament however uh, uh, just that attached of course to the anterior subiliac spine and uh, pubic uh, tubercle now guys there is a triangular uh, defect here which is located immediately uh, above and lateral to the pubic tuber to the uh, pubic tubercle this defect known as superficial inguinal ring يعني هذا الابنيوروسيس خلينا نختصرها للاكسترنال اوبليك تحت العضل هاي الخارجي external oblique muscle إلى abneurosis هذا تحت عند المنطقة هاي بينلتف على نفسه بيعمل inguinal ligament ligament مهم جدا بيمشي بيمسك بالانتيريور anterior superior spine ولا بالبيوبيك توبركل هلا في فتحة في هذا اسمها superficial inguinal ring هاي مهمة وين مكانها بقدر أحط إصبعي فيها نعم بقدر أحط إصبعي فيها لازم تحط إصبعك فيها قدر الإمكان وين بتوقع؟ أول شيء يعني لازم أعالجه على السنفس بيوبس هون، في عندي البيوبيك توبركل علمتكم عليه، هذا البيوبيك توبركل، جاست وين بتيجي هاي؟ فوقه ولاتيراليلو، جاست ميبي أراوند 1 سنتيمتر أو سو، ذيس إز ذي سوبرفيشال إنجوينال رينج. أوكي. If you look to the superficial inguinal ring, you will see that it has two crura. One is lateral crura and one is the medial. The lateral crura, guys, attached to the pubic tubercle. But the medial crura attached to the, uh, uh, as you see, to the pubic crest. And you see the fibers here like transverse in, in the direction. These are from the deep fascia so it creates a kind of a fiber known as intercrural intercrural 
fibers. Then I'm between two crura, so right cross and left cross. So these fibers are intercrural fibers. What's the function of it? It's just to prevent this ring from widening, just tightening it and prevents it from widening like that. Okay. Let us shift fast to the second deep muscle to it, which is the internal oblique muscle. Okay, originate from number fascia iliac crest, as you see, but most importantly, it originates here, very important. From the, look at the, because you know that the external oblique muscle, it creates a kind of inguinal ligament. This is the inguinal ligament, right? Now, the internal oblique deep to it originates from the lateral two-thirds of it. Look at the fibers of it, originates from the lateral two-thirds of it. This is important. The origin of the internal big, uh, muscle is important because I will let you know why. However, it's uh, uh, um, inserted up the uh, lower three ribs and linea alba, pubic uh, crest and so forth. So let us move deep to the third last muscle which is the uh, transversus abdominis muscle look at its fibers okay um, originates from lumbar fascia in the back um, uh, down here from the inner lip of iliac crest you remember the inner lip but most importantly it originates from lateral one third not two-thirds, lateral one-third of inguinal ligament. That means this is the inguinal ligament. So, it originates, look at the fiber here. So, it originates from the lateral one-third. Because you remember the internal oblique muscle, it originates from lateral, not one-third, from lateral two-thirds. So, when we removed this muscle, we found an, the transverse abdomen, but it originates just from the lateral one-third. Inserted in the Zyvoiter process, because it's large, look at it. Zyvoiter process, linea alba, and uh, pubic crest, those in the midline. So guys, what's the significance of the origin of those two muscles? Look at it here. Again, this is the anterior superior iliac spine. Anterior superior iliac spine. Okay, here is the, uh, uh, I would say, pubic tubercle. So this ligament is the inguinal ligament. Inguinal ligament formed by what? Inguinal ligament, as I said, formed by the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle okay this is, that means this is it represents the external oblique excellent let us go deep we will find another muscle which is the internal oblique okay this is the internal oblique look at it here it originates from the let me erase this so look at the internal oblique it originates from i would say the uh, lateral two-third of the inguinal ligament but go back you will find another muscle the transversus abdominis muscle which originates from just look at it here from just the lateral one-third of the inguinal ligament okay that's laterally but look at the uh, internal oblique guys and transversus abdominis medially. Medially, they join, they are united um, uh, or joining each other to form like a tendon. This tendon, a strong tendon, is the conjoint tendon. So, the internal oblique muscle and transversus abdominis near the midline, they unite 
to form a one united tendon known as conjoined tendon. You know the conjoined uh, tendon is important to support the superficial inguinal ring. So let us talk about the, uh, I would say maybe the last or the muscle before the last one, which is the rectus abdominis muscle. Those, you know, um, uh, athletes, I think, try to sometime uh, show it, especially, especially those uh, bodybuilders and so forth. So look at it here. It's parallel to the midline. The rectus abdominis muscle uh, has many uh, 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 quarters. So it originates from here from two heads, from pubic tubercle and the pubic um, crest and uh, front of symphysis pubis as well. And inserted in the, uh, as you see, uh, fifth, sixth and seventh costal cartilage and zygote process, of course. Now, this strap muscle extends, as you see, along the whole length of the anterior abdominal wall and it shows a kind of look at these tendons transverse tendinous intersection transverse tendinous intersection because they are like intersection the uh, intersect the muscle so and transversely so furthermore if you look to the muscle what else Yes, when you look to the muscle, guys, it's located, look at the rectus sheath here. There is a fibrous sheath here, cut it here, and we cut it from, or the author, of course, cut it from here to show you that it's enclosed in a fibrous sheath known as rectus sheath. What's the rectus sheath? Okay, but before that, before that, guys, let me show you the location of the um, tendinous intersection. Simply, there is one close to the zygote process. And a tendinous intersection at the level of umbilicus. And there is one in between. Here. One at the level of zygote process, umbilicus, and one in between. So, this tendinous intersection connects the muscle, you see, it's part of the muscle, to the anterior wall. What does it mean? Okay, look, this is the cross-section of your anterior abdominal wall. So, this is the rectus abdominis, and this is tendinous intersection that connects the muscle anteriorly, but not posteriorly, right? So, nothing posteriorly. Here is just a uh, surface anatomy, you can look at it, guys. Uh, but uh, I'm going to invest the time so you can look at it. And uh, it's interesting to know the surface anatomy, like umbilicus, the location of the process. Here is the linea alba, linea seminaris, symphysis pubis, pubic tubercle, and anterior superior iliac spine, anterior superior iliac spine, inguinal ligament. Right? Okay. Now, guys, let us define the rectus sheet. Yes, we mentioned that the rectus abdominis muscle is located inside a sheath. This sheath, we opened it and we removed the muscles. So, this is the rectus sheath. It's formed by a neurosis of the three muscles. You remember the external oblique and internal oblique and the transverse abdominus? Yes. These muscles, as you see, guys, let me show you. As you see here, they have uh, aponeurosis. They end anteriorly, they continue anterior with aponeurosis. These aponeurosis, guys, form the rectus sheath. So, let us have a cross-section 
above this line. You see this line? Funny line, okay? I will show you why. It has the cross section here and the cross section here. Above this line, RQ8 line, RQ8 يعني متجوز. Let us have a look here. So guys, this section above the RQ8 line, I will tell you why. You know the skin. This is the anterior abdominal wall. شباب انتوا فاهمين علي الان ولا انا بسولف لحالي؟ معك دكتور فاهمين علي ولا سطلتوا؟ فاهمين طب اكمل ولا تاخذوا بريك خمس دقائق؟ كمل عادي دكتور طيب ماشي So guys uh, we mentioned that this is the rectus abdominis muscle Rectus abdominis abdominis muscle. So let us have a cross section through the anterior abdominal wall. So anteriorly you have the skin. Deep to skin, you have superficial fascia. Ah, deep to superficial fascia. We mentioned that we have deep fascia and muscular layer. You know, this is the external oblique. Just to know, this is the midline, huh? This is the midline, had the nose. So this is the external oblique muscle, internal oblique and Transversus abdominis. Look at the external oblique muscle. You know, it continues as I mentioned by anteriorly by aponeurosis. This is the aponeurosis of external oblique. This is the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle. Okay, what about the transversus abdominis? So, this is the transversus abdominis, most the deepest one, and this is the aponeurosis of transversus abdominis. Look at it; it passes behind the rectus abdominis muscle. Also here, look at it; it passes behind the rectus abdominis muscle. So, anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle, until now, till now, you have the aponeurosis of external oblique. And behind it, there is a neurosis of transversus abdominis. But what about the middle muscle, the internal oblique muscle? This is the internal oblique muscle, and this is the aponeurosis of it. Then the aponeurosis of internal oblique, internal oblique. Once it reaches the rectus abdominis muscle, it splits into two sheets, one anterior to the muscle and one posterior to the muscle. Also here, this is the internal oblique muscle and this is the aponeurosis of it that splits into anterior sheath and posterior sheath or anterior to the rectus abdominis and posterior to it. Guys, this sheath is the, look at it, one, two, three, and the middle one is split it. So you have two layers anterior to the muscle, two layers posterior to the muscle. This is the rectus sheath. Here we go. We removed this part so you can see it here. This is the rectus sheath. هذا هو rectus sheath. اللي بحيط بالمسلس. Right or left. ماشي. Okay, but the the trick is here, guys. Now, the trick is here. You see the umbilicus? This is the umbilicus. And the symphysis pubis? Yes. I would say uh, the area in between is the location of this line, arcuate line. I will tell you about it, but I want you to look at it first. But there is another way to look at it. You, you know the anterior superior iliac spine? It's almost at the same level. It's close to the level of anterior superior iliac spine. However, this at uh, this region, guys, the look what happened. There is a defect here below this arcuate line. Let us take a cross section here below this line. Here's section below arcuate line. 
Look at it here, guys. All the aponeuroses of all muscles shifted to the front. Look. Already we know that the aponeurosis of external oblique anteriorly. And look at the transverse abdomen. The aponeurosis of it shifted anteriorly to the muscle. And look at the internal oblique muscle in the middle. Also all um, uh, shifted, all aponeurosis shifted to the front of the muscle. Which is, I would say, make it like weaker, I would say. So nothing. Nothing behind the muscle. So when you remove this muscle, you will find this. Nothing. There is no aponeurosis. Look. Below the, below the arcuate line, there is no aponeurosis behind the muscle. Look. There is no aponeurosis. Where is the aponeurosis? No aponeurosis. Just you have just transversalis fascia. Do you remember the transversalis fascia? That's located behind the muscle. That's it. And peritoneum, of course and extraveritoneal fat. No aponeurosis. All they are sh below this line, all aponeurosis shifted to the front. That's it. Look at it here. This is the muscle reflected. يعني هاي وهاي القطعة من الركتس أبدومينوس كانت هون يا شباب. تمام؟ وهاي كانت هون. بعدين قطعناها هيك ورحنا بهاي هيك وفتحنا هاي هيك. وهاي this is the arcuate line. So, look, this is the arcuate line. So, this is the muscle reflected. So, behind the muscle is the rectus sheath. Ya yes, salam. Okay. Until the arcuate line. But below the arcuate line, oh, there is no sheath. Right? No sheath behind the muscle. All they are reflected to the front. Okay. Here is also the arcuate line so above the arcuate line there is a rectus sheet behind the muscle because this is the muscle and we can so this sheet behind it right so but below it there is no rectus sheet now okay this is very nice uh, view guys uh, you will see here in which we open the um, rectus sheath here to, f to look to the structure inside it. This is the arcuate line, right? So below it, there is no rectus sheath behind the muscle. Anyway, inside the rectus sheath, we have rectus abdominis muscle and biromedalis muscle, which is muscle located here and sometimes not exist, sometimes absent in some people. So also, we have the superior epigastric vessels and inferior epigastric superior and inferior epigastric inside the sheet somebody can say where is exactly just behind the muscle look at it here this is the rectus abdominis this is superior epigastric artery and inferior epigastric artery located directly in the rectus sheath behind the muscle this is the rectus sheath So look below the arcuate line, all abneurosis shifted to the front. Anyway. Of course, you have uh, uh, the nerve there, the anterior rimae, of course, of um, spinal nerve from T7 to T12 with the lymphatics. This is a baromedalis. Muscle, small muscle located here, attached to linea, alba, and uh, pubic uh, symphysis and pubic crest. Okay, here is the linea alba, the tendinous uh, ver um, vertical midline, fibrous band extended from xiphoid to process all the way down until you reach the symphysis pubis, which are uh, formed by the fusion of the aponeurosis of abdominal or however lateral to the rectus abdominis this is the rectus abdominis muscle lateral to it and of course attached to the ribs of rib number nine to the to the ninth to the um, tip of the ninth costal cartridge sorry here is the uh, 
uh, linear semilunaris, which is a curved ridge formed by the lateral margin of rectus abdominis muscle, right? Here, okay. Now that's uh, mainly the uh, anatomical part and I would like guys to start with the clinical part. Uh, now, I think you remember that we divided the um, abdomen into nine regions and this region was known as inguinal region. Yes, this is the most potential um, a location for herniation herniation يعني الافتاق 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 البطن الافتاق الى اخره so uh, this groin or inguinal region which is the um, area between the uh, 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 junction between the thigh of course and the uh, abdominal uh, wall as you see which extends you know bounded or extend between the anterior superior iliac spine and pubic uh, uh, tubercle this is the border uh, between uh, these if you even guys if you find it difficult you can just look to the crease here which is indicates that yes Doctor, ice cream. Uh, uh, okay تمام وصلتك يا صديقي اذا بدك اطلع وادخل اذا بدك اوكي تمام so there is a crease here that يعني طوية skin which indicates the inguinal uh, ligament from anterior superior spine to the pubic tubercle يعني لو ما قدرت تعرف انت على البيشنت كان اوبيز تلاقي هون ثنية skin ما بين الثاي والinferior part من الابدومين is the, the location of the inguinal ligament Anyway, uh, majority of the abdominal herniation occurs at this uh, 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 location or at this region. So, again, you remember the external oblique muscle and you know that anteriorly it's continued as aponeurosis to the midline and we said that the inferior part of this aponeurosis reflected on itself to form the ligament known as inguinal ligament. This is the inguinal ligament attached from sub anterior subedic spine and the pubic tubercle. And we said that this abneurosis has an opening. This opening, which is like a triangular shape, in which we call it the superficial inguinal ring. Superficial, inguinal, inguinal region, ring. And guys, most importantly now, let us start with this. Let us say, yes, this is the uh, superficial inguinal ring. We have to locate the superficial inguinal ring and the deep inguinal ring. And in between, this is the superficial inguinal ring and this is the deep one. And between the two rings, guys, there is canal. Sorry, there is canal known as inguinal canal. So, this is the inguinal canal. Okay, but this is not the end of the story. Let us define where is this. You have to know. You have to put your finger there. Where is the superficial inguinal ring? Okay, here is the superficial inguinal ring, which is located just, it is, uh, uh, guys, at the first, it's above the inguinal ligament. Above, not below. Nothing is below. The superficial inguinal ring is above the inguinal uh, ligament, which is, uh, uh, guys, uh, what I want to say here that it's located, you know, the pubic tubercle. There's a pubic tubercle. So above, above, and lateral to it, directly, is the superficial inguinal ring. Hello. Somebody can say, okay. Excellent, but how can I locate the deep one? You know the anterior superior spine and the pubic tubercle, and this is the inguinal ligament? Yes. 
the midpoint of inguinal ligament. Just about one centimeter above the midpoint of inguinal ligament is the deep inguinal ring. Can you, can you see it? No, because it's deep, but this is the location of it. You can put your finger here, just superficially, right? So, here, guys. Okay, here is the symphysis pubis. And this is the pubic tubercle. Pubic tubercle. And this is the anterior superior ilex spine. Anterior superior ilex spine. Excellent. So, this is the, uh, I would say, here. Inguinal ligament. Okay, so, above and lateral to the pubic tubercle is the superficial inguinal ring. Remember, it's above the inguinal ligament. And again, this is the inguinal ligament midpoint here. Just go up one centimeter. This is the deep inguinal ring. Similarly, on the other side, right? So, and in between this area is the inguinal canal. So this is on uh, the surface, okay. Guys, the um, inguinal canal now, as I mentioned, connects, uh, is a connection, inter, uh, intramuscular connection, intramuscular passage between the superficial ring and deep ring, which is about four centimeters. Somebody can say, yes, I want to locate it, which is, you know, it's easy at the first. It is above, 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 above the inguinal and parallel above and parallel to the inguinal ligament look at it this is the inguinal ligament so it's above it and parallel to it where's exactly okay this is the mid of uh inguinal ligament so it's located above mainly the medial half above the medial half of the inguinal ligament يعني هذا لو قلنا هذا نص laterally وهذا نص الميديال تبع الانجونال ليجمنت هون الانجونال كنال above and parallel to the medial half of inguinal ligament now uh, what's the contents of the uh, this canal look at it here in the male in the male we have a spermatic cord this is the spermatic cord. But in female, you know, female has no testes, so it's replaced by round ligament of uterus. It's a strong ligament. That's why the female has less susceptibility to get um, hernia, inguinal herniation. I would say the uh, indirect one. Because there is direct and indirect, we'll talk about that. Furthermore, we have genital branch of genitofemoral nerve and we partially we have a, a small nerve known as ilioinguinal nerve passes just for a short time then it exits the superficial ring. So guys, take care for these structures and we'll, uh, uh, please you have to know these structures these are very important. I will show you after a couple of slides more and more. So this is a repeated uh, slide just to remind you with the superficial ring. And uh, yes, this is the superficial ring and this is the deep ring. And in between there is a canal, inter intramuscular canal known as uh, inguinal uh, canal. But you have an idea about the deep inguinal ring. But what about the uh, the superficial inguinal ring, which is located, guys, here, right? Above, this is a pubic tubercle, above and lateral to pubic tubercle. But where is the deep inguinal ring, as I mentioned? Okay, this is the inguinal ligament. It is just at the one centimeter above the, as I mentioned, one centimeter above the middle of the inguinal ligament. We covered that, okay? Yes, here is the very important point, especially those interested in surgery. Guys, look at the uh, 
deep in Guna Ring. This opening, guys, located lateral to the inferior epigastric artery. Look at the inferior epigastric artery. It's lateral. The opening of deep inguinal, the uh, deep inguinal ring, is lateral to the uh, inferior epigastric artery. Please keep this in your mind. Okay. Now let us talk a little bit about the uh, uh, inguinal canal. Now, that's look. This canal, that's located between the superficial and deep one well guys if you look at it here you will see that anterior wall this is the superficial inguinal ring and here is the deep inguinal ring and don't look inferior to it this is the inguinal ligament right so that means the this is the canal here this is the canal So, anterior to the inguinal canal, we have aponeurosis of external oblique muscle, right? Along its entire length. And also, we have the, if you look here, I would like to show you here better. Okay, start from this figure. This is the linea alba in the middle, symphysis pubis and anterior superior leg spine and this is the inguinal ligament you know why because this muscle is the external oblique from outside right this is the aponeurosis of external oblique that has an opening here which is the superficial inguinal ring so this the canal should be here so anterior to the canal is the uh, aponeurosis of external oblique now remove this muscle remove the external oblique you will get here so when you remove the external oblique you will find the internal oblique and if you remember we mentioned that the the origin and i said it's important the origin of internal oblique muscle from the lateral two-third of the inguinal ligament that means this is the inguinal canal because this is a superficial inguinal. so this is the inguinal canal and the internal oblique covers as you see the lateral half of that canal and not just that but also as you see here so this is the internal oblique muscle covers the anterior self or lateral half of the canal furthermore the internal oblique muscle guys look at it from its fibers it gives fibers to cover the contents of the canal this muscle is the cremastric muscle okay let us remove the internal oblique and look to the deep to it we have the third layer of muscle which is transversus muscle and we mentioned also that the origin of transversus abdominis muscle from the lateral one-third of inguinal ligament yes but it has nothing to cover so it doesn't cover the inguinal canal so this is the superficial inguinal ring deep inguinal ring inguinal canal so it's not covered by transversus abdominis muscle so just covered by a neuros of external oblique and the internal oblique that covers the posterior half uh, or lateral half of it but guys posterior to the inguinal canal you have the fascia here which is the fascia transversalis you remember it which is located deep to the muscles right furthermore guys medially medially here this is the superficial inguinal ring yes and deep inguinal ring and this is the canal so 
it's supported posteriorly by conjoint tendon that's formed by the tendon of internal oblique and tendon of transverse abdominals. They unite it, as I mentioned for a couple of sides, to form conjoint tendon. So they support the superficial inguinal ring from the back. Uh, so the floor formed by um, lacunar ligament here, guys. And what about the roof? Okay, let me show you again the roof. Uh, find the slide now. Okay. This is the inguinal canal. What's the roof of it? The roof is the arch created by two muscles. This one, which is the internal oblique uh, muscle, and another arch by the transverse abdominus muscle here. So those located like superior to the inguinal canal. So if you go here, you will find what I said, abdominus of external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominus, these guys, and try to translate what I mentioned like uh, on this figure. So we mentioned that the content of the um, inguinal canal is in male, we have the spermatic uh, cord here. What's the spermatic cord? Spermatic cord, guys, is a spermatic cord is a collection of structures, as you see here. This is a spermatic cord, right? So collection of structures that pass from the uh, testis to the, uh, through the inguinal canal, of course, to the abdominal cavity. That means it's a connection between abdominal cavity to the testis. That means um, loops of your intestine can move here. So guys, this is the spermatic cord through the inguinal canal and covered by uh, three layers, external spermatic fascia, internal spermatic fascia, and in between the cremastric fascia. Okay, somebody can say, they come from where? Okay, I will tell you. You remember the external oblique amniurosis? Forget that this is exist. Forget this at all. Say it's not exist at all, right? So, if you know that the testis descends from the abdominal cavity into the scrotum. يعني testis بتنزل من الأبدومينال كافيتي على السكروتم تحت. So imagine when it passes through this abdominal wall, it will take a couple of covers. So the it will take the peritoneum uh, and it will take transversalis fascia something from internal oblique guys and something from internal uh, uh, oblique sorry and from external oblique now let us understand what it will take so with one statistic descends say this is one cover two cover three cover so this is the testis so it will take these three layers and they become like covers for it. But you have to know the arrangement of them. So the most external one will continue the external one, which is from the external oblique of neurosis and it creates as, uh, and it creates a kind of external spermatic fascia. Okay, deep to it, you remember guys, the internal oblique muscle and we said that here the internal oblique Look at the internal oblique muscle. It gives fibers to the spermatic uh, cord. This is a cremastric muscle. Where is that? Okay. Here is the internal oblique muscle, and this is the fiber that gives to them. And these fibers form the cremastric fascia and muscle. Now, the transversalis fascia, guys, gives the internal spermatic fascia. So we have external, internal, and venicromastic fascia. 
So these are the covers again shown here with the structure inside. Now, what's these structures, guys? Very important. You have to know all of these structures. You have the vast difference that carries the uh, sperms from the testis out to the penis. And guys, this vast difference has an artery known as artery of vast difference. Also, you have the genital branch of genitofemoral nerve, which is from lumbar plexus L1, L2, located here. It will innervate the cremastric muscle. And also, guys, you have testicular artery because this is testis. So we have testicular artery and venous plexus here shown in the blue color. It's the not testicular vein, it's not correct to say testicular vein, because at the end they will form testicular vein, but they are pampiniform plexus. Pampiniform venous plexus. Of course, lymphatics, autonomic nerves, and you will find also a kind of remnant of processus vaginalis. Look at it here. You know the peritoneum? This is the peritoneum, right? So, the peritoneum, when the testis descends, it invaginates the peritoneum, right? Like this. But this invagination should be obliterated and ends. So, this invagination of peritoneum should be obliterated and ends. But sometime, it's still open and it creates a kind of congenital hernia, right? So, you can read it by yourself because we don't have time for that. But, uh, uh, yes, you can. Well, you know what? Let me explain to you. Again, this is the inguinal ligament. And this is the superficial inguinal ligament and this is the deep inguinal sorry superficial inguinal ring and deep inguinal ring and this is the canal look at the support here شوف ربنا كيف خالقها يعني deep inguinal ring supported anteriorly by the internal oblique muscle because we mentioned it covers the posterior half of the uh, canal but the superficial inguinal ring supported Posteriorly, not anteriorly like this, posteriorly by the conjoint tendon. خلفها يعني مدعم بالconjoint tendon. Also this arch, the roof of the inguinal, above the inguinal canal, created by inguinal, in internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. When case of there is straining and defecation or during the uh, parturition, when these muscles contracted, this arch will disappear and it will close this gap. And this also supports this weak region, like this. You can read it and understand what I'm saying. Already explained. Now, guys, maybe the minute you are waiting, the hernia um, among the abdomen in general composed from the uh, sac and this sac has a neck and body this is the body this is the hernial sac this is the hernial sac يعني هذا هو الفتاق الفتاق عبارة عن sac له neck وبدي this sac covered by you know uh, it has coverings these are the covering of the sac known as hernial covering And of course, inside the sac, there is a content and usually formed by loops of intestine. يعني جزء من الأمعاء لما بصير افتاق جزء من الأمعاء تخترق جدار البطن وبتعمل برج هي كطال على برا. There are a couple of uh, types of uh, hernia. 
I will start with the most important one, which is the indirect inguinal hernia. Now, you know this is the conjoint tendon medially, and you know this is the uh, deep inguinal ring. Do you remember the deep inguinal ring? And this is the superficial inguinal ring. And this is the canal, inguinal canal. So, if the loops of intestine passes through the deep inguinal canal, the deep inguinal ring, um, through the inguinal canal, this is called indirect inguinal hernia. من الآخر إذا لوب من الانتستن مشت هون عند لوز of انتستن مشت من خلال الديب انجونال رينج ومشت بالانجونال كنال هذا بسميه indirect انجونال هيرنيا مش direct لا تخربط indirect الدirect بكون من هون okay so this is the uh, indirect inguinal uh, hernia mainly it's congenital in origin because sometimes why it's congenital mostly you know this congenital but not always you see this uh, follow me look at the peritoneum the cover of the peritoneum look at it it should be closed at this point but it's still not closed follow it in the inguinal canal, it's still open. So, sometime this processus vaginalis should be obliterated and closed completely. And so there is no way for any loop of intestine to come in the canal. But sometime, for a reason or another, it's open or reopened because of extra pressure. So the loop of intestine can recanalize it and pass through the inguinal uh, canal. So guys, in this case, the this is important. The hernial sac, the hernial sac passes or enters the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring. And of course, if you notice that the the herniation or the hernial sac will be lateral. To the inferior epigastric artery because the deep inguinal ring already lateral to it so the hernial sac will be lateral to the inferior epigastric artery this is important for surgery not to injure this nerve uh, not to injure this artery and cause a bleeding and at the surface you will see the uh, pulse above and medial to pubic tubercle let me show you for example, say, say for example, this is the indirect inguinal hernia, this is pubic tubercle, so the herniated sac will be above and medial, above and medial, not below and lateral, above the pubic tubercle and medial to it, right? Okay. But sometimes, you know, that usually this hernia sac in the indirect can reach the testis and scrotum because it passes through a spermatic cord, right? I will show you after a couple, uh, after two slides. Now let us shift to the direct inguinal hernia. What does, what's the difference? Yes, this is the deep inguinal ring, so nothing will pass from here. No. So directly behind the superficial inguinal ring, behind the superficial inguinal ring. Do you remember the conjoint tendon medially? Yes, the loop of intestine creates a kind of extra pressure here until it penetrates the fascia transversalis, which is very weak, and get an entrance into the superficial inguinal ring. And the pulse will be shown like this one. I, I just used it before a couple of slides just to show you the pulse. So let us um, say one thing else. You know this region, this region that's located behind the superficial inguinal ring, this is known as inguinal triangle or Hessel patch triangle, which is the 
region of direct inguinal hernia. So look at the hernia sac is wide because there is no point like this to pass through, right? So guys, look at you are looking this very very nice um, uh, um, picture you see here, guys. The abdominal wall from the back. You you are inside the abdomen now. Look at the deep inguinal ring, and this is the uh, uh, inguinal uh, ligament. So. In case if there is indirect hernia, the loops of intestine will get in from here. But if there is direct hernia, like that way we are talk about. So this is where this is the uh, superficial inguinal ring. Yes, the pressure will be here in the inguinal triangle here, right? This is the inguinal triangle bounded by the rectus abdominis muscle inferior epigastric vessel and the inguinal ligament. This is a very important region. You have to know the borders of it, right? Look at it here. The direct hernia behind the inguinal triangle, the loops of intestine creates a pressure, then passes to the superficial, to the superficial inguinal ring. Outside the spermatic cord, لاحظ إنه the herniated sac خارج السبرماتيك كورد ما بتفوت عندك على التستس على الخصية أو على السكروتم برا بتطلع زي هيك يعني زي هاي but in the, di in the indirect hernia the loops of intestine pass through the deep inguinal ring through the uh, deep uh, through the deep inguinal ring then inguinal canal then superficial inguinal ring then inside your spermatic cord then can descend to your testis like that and guys uh, now to uh, discriminate the type of uh, inguinal hernia you know we have direct and indirect let me remind you that in the indirect inguinal hernia the loops of intestine uh, will pass through the deep inguinal ring as you see here and passes through the inguinal canal then superficial inguinal ring deep to the scrotum or we may not reach the scrotum however in the direct inguinal hernia uh, the uh, loops of intestine uh, 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 pass at the end to the superficial inguinal ring that means both the direct and indirect inguinal hernia uh, both inguinal hernia types exit the superficial inguinal ring that means palpation of the impulse here at the superficial inguinal ring is not uh, most of the time is not enough so what we have to do in or when you test the indirect inguinal hernia you um, have to put uh, the finger of course at the superficial inguinal ring right guys and make sure you feel the deep the location around the deep inguinal ring as well so when you ask the patient to cough you will feel impulse uh, at the uh, site of superficial inguinal ring and also yeah, Defaic impulse at the superficial inguinal ring here, and you will feel also like a mass here at the uh, when the patient cough a mass at the deep inguinal ring. Now, for uh, when you uh, test the superficial the um, direct inguinal ring, you can insert your finger in the superficial inguinal ring as you see here. And you ask the patient to cough. Indeed, what you will feel, do you remember the hassel patch triangle or the inguinal triangle, which is, I would say, mostly uh, located this region? So, well, the, the loops of intestine, guys, will uh, push the, uh, once they ask the patient to cough, you will uh, feel like 
an impulse in the media side of your uh, finger. This is when your finger in the superficial angular ring. You can insert uh, relatively the, your finger in the superficial, uh, superficial angular ring. So the loops of intestine will push the um, the medial side of your finger. But also, you can just put your finger here at the Hessel patch triangle or the inguinal triangle here. Just put it like this and ask the patient to cough. So you will hear, you will, um, sorry, uh, you will feel the uh, impulse against the tip or the pad of your, or pad of your finger. So this is the direct, uh, you will say yes, this is direct inguinal hernia. Now to the second or third part of hernia, which is common especially in female because of the um, wide pelvis they have. So again, this is the inguinal ligament and this is the pubic uh, tubercle. So when the neck of herniated sac below and lateral to the pubic tubercle, you would say, yes, this is femoral hernia. But when, when the neck of herniated sac, which is and uh, uh, above the pubic tubercle and directed medial to it, this is uh, inguinal hernia, as you see, for example, mm, here, because the picture is another hand person. So, Again, this is uh, the inguinal hernia in which the neck of the sac, if there is, say, this is a pubic um, a tubercle, so it's above and um, medial to the pubic tubercle. However, in the uh, femoral hernia, guys, uh, you know that just in the region below the medial part of uh, or medial half of the inguinal ligament, just below it, not above it. Now we talked about uh, uh, region below the uh, inguinal ligament, in which it it, uh, it, it contains a couple of structures, uh, some of them encircled with a sheath, like femoral um, uh, canal here, and we have femoral vein, femoral artery, those encircled with a femoral sheath, and later to them we have a femoral nerve. Do you know a femoral nerve is not covered by femoral sheath? Anyway, so these guys' structures, relatively, they are not weak, but except the medial, most medial part of it, which is, uh, doesn't really contain uh, tough structures like um, uh, these vessels and so forth. It's just a femoral canal for lymphatics. It contains uh, uh, lymphatics. So the femoral canal is the most medial part in the femoral, she femoral sheath below the inguinal ligament. And it's the weakest point in which the, uh, uh, the hernia sac descends through the femoral uh, canal within the femoral sheath. So guys, uh, sometimes because the neck, this is the hernia sac, this is the neck of it, and this is the body of it. So the neck of the hernia sac usually struggled within the um, femoral, uh, uh, femoral uh, ring, and because the uh, narrow neck here it becomes like irreducible. You cannot return it back by your finger or so and becomes like strangulated. Here's guys, uh, just roughly, uh, well, you just know that we have uh, umbilical, uh, different types of uh, uh, umbilical hernia. We have congenital umbilical hernia, which is caused by failure of parts of medgut loops to return back uh, to the abdominal cavity during the fetal development. Also, we have acquired infantile umbilical hernia, in which small uh, 
hernia, as you see here, guys, caused by weakness of the umbilical scar at the mid of the abdominal wall at the linear alpha, right? So this usually occurs in children and disappears without any treatment. They used to put a kind of a piece of coin here previously, but it disappears usually without any treatment. But you have guys acquired umbilical hernia in adults in which it's known as this is the umbilicus yes it can be like uh, around it close to it it's known as para umbilical hernia because what because of uh, a weakness in the linea alpha you know that the linea alpha is the uh, formed by the fusion of the or the summit of the uh, summation sorry fusion of the aponeurosis of uh, oblique muscles and transverse abdominals or the anterior abdominal muscles. So it's most mainly common with uh, 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 in women, those with repeated pregnancies. So guys, the hernia also can be at any region between the zyvoja process and umbilicus. So it can be here. So in this case, it's called Ebigastric hernia. Usually small, and especially those uh, 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 manual workers. I think uh, we have an idea about the rectus uh, muscle on both sides. Sometimes they are separated, and the hernial sac lies between the medial margin. Of the two recti, commonly with the, uh, 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 in women, especially those elderly, multivarous women, those with multiple pregnancies. I mean, the cause usually because of weakness of uh, the uh, recti muscles. So they have this uh, shape, indeed, of abdomen. You know, usually uh, or sometime after like surgeries, you will get an incisional hernia. This post operative incisional hernia, which is large seen here, usually because of damage of segmental nerves that supplying the uh, muscle of the anterior abdominal wall, and sometimes because of infection with necrosis of the muscle and so forth. But not just incisional, we have also. Um, herniation uh, occur in the epineurosis of transversus abdominis uh, lateral to rectus muscle you know this is the rectus muscle here and here so lateral to it guys in the here is the linea semilunaris because you know that the linea semilunaris is created by the lateral edge of rectus abdominis muscle so herniation here in the uh, epineurosis of transversus abdominis muscle lateral to the rectus sheath uh, can have in although it's rare, but it does happen usually below the umbilicus. So, uh, what I want from you guys to know that the blood supply for the anterior abdominal wall comes from three arteries. The first one is the from the internal thoracic artery. This is the internal thoracic artery that gives two brands. I'm a sacrophrenic, but I'm concerned here with the superior epigastric artery, right? But we have inferior epigastric, but it comes from the common iliac artery. So, under a source of blood supply is from common iliac that gives two branch. Inferior epigastric, that anastomota do is the superior one, and this deep circum, deep circumflex iliac artery to supply this iliac region. Similar to the um, names of arteries of common iliac, we have also arteries from the uh, uh, common, uh, from the femoral artery here. We have the same name, but superficial, right? Here is the superficial epigastric and Superficial circumflex iliac. Uh, this is uh, our references, and thank you.